Good morning, church. I'm wearing the same shirt I wore on Sunday afternoon. Can you guess why? Anyway, I wanted to take you to Matthew 27. Now, I know Easter was a few weeks ago, and I know we're supposed to, like, not talk about Good Friday and Easter on days that aren't Good Friday and Easter, but that's okay. I'm going to take you to Matthew 27. It's the chapter in Matthew where Jesus is being crucified. And as we get to that chapter, I want to take you to this verse 41, where we're going to start today. It says this, In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. So here's Jesus. He's hanging on the cross, and he's being mocked. It says this then in verse 43, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. In other words, they are mocking Jesus and taunting Jesus because he said he was the Son of God, so let God rescue him if he's really all that good of a person. You know, if he really is following God, then let God rescue him. Anyway, then we skip to verse 45. It says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came all over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. I want to pause there for just a moment. See, what Jesus says on the cross has been misunderstood for centuries. And the first time he said it, it was misunderstood. See, Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And people think he's calling Elijah. And that's because If you're really, 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 really uh, tired, exhausted or something, and you were calling Elijah, you would have pronounced Eliyah in Hebrew. And maybe they would have thought you were too tired to get out the last little ah, or maybe that last little ah was just a moan. And so anyway, they they hear Jesus. He says Eli, and they think he says Eliyah, but Eli means my God. And what's interesting is that Matthew, the person who's giving us this gospel, he gives us the accurate translation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know it's the accurate translation because it's a direct quote from an Old Testament passage, Mark, excuse me, in, in Psalm 22. I'm going to get to that in just a little bit. But the point I want to make here is that people constantly misunderstand what Jesus is saying on the cross. What they think Jesus is saying on the cross back then is he's calling on Elijah to come and save him. But then modern Christians also get this wrong. They think Jesus is hanging on the cross, crying out, God, why have you forsaken me? As if God had forsaken him. It's become a very popular uh, Christian thought for people to say that when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he's covered so much with sin that God the Father has to turn his face away. It's made it into songs. It's made it into uh, all kinds of statements where God must have turned his face away because he couldn't look at the sin. The problem is, Jesus is quoting exactly Psalm 22. And I think Jesus knew Psalm 22. And I think we've got a lot of evidence for Jesus knowing Psalm 22. In fact, I want to take you to Psalm 22 because what Jesus says here is exactly verse 1 of Psalm 22. And I wonder if Jesus might not have also known the rest of the verses. Here's what it says. I'm going to take you through all of it. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Maybe you felt like that before. Maybe you feel like that right now, where you've called out to God and it feels like he's far away from you. You've called out to God, it feels like he is nowhere near. And you're saying, God, why are you so far from saving me? I wonder if Jesus might have felt that kind of God, why, when he's hanging on the cross that sort of desperation of the sense that God is really far away. I cry out to you, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Is it possible Jesus felt that same way, the same way you and I feel when we're wondering where is God in all of this? Verse three, yet 
You are enthroned as the Holy One. You're the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted in you and you delivered them. And to you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. This is Jesus saying, listen, there were people in the past who paid attention to you, who trusted you, and you didn't let them down. This is the psalmist, Psalm 22, whoever wrote it, it's the psalmist saying, listen, there was a time in the past when people trusted in you and you didn't put them to shame. Everyone who's going through a difficult time with God wonders why God moves in other people's lives, but not necessarily in theirs. Verse six, it says, but I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Um, wait, wait a minute. We, we literally just read that in Matthew. That is literally the exact thing that the people said while Jesus was hanging on the cross. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him. That's interesting. All who see me mock me, hurling insults. Let's keep going. Verse 9, yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. This is a, about a, a person who's been special and identified by God from birth. Verse 11, he says, Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help almost as if all of his closest friends had deserted him. Uh, verse 12, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. How did the writer of Psalm 22 know that when you're being crucified on the cross, not only do your bones pop out of joint and your interior organs turn to jelly, even to the point where when Jesus was pierced with a sword, blood and water came out. Verse 15, he says, my, my, my mouth is dried up like a pot shard and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. How did the writer of Psalm 22 know that Jesus expressed complaint twice that he was thirsty? You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. How in the world did the writer of Psalm 22 get all of these things down? How in the world did the people watching the crucifixion hear Jesus say his words and not understand he was talking about this? How did all the Jewish people miss Psalm 22 for so long so that Matthew had to finally point out with an accurate quotation of Jesus what Jesus was saying? Verse 19, a plea, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. You're my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. The writer of Psalm 22 is begging God to come to his deliverance, come to his aid. He says, if you do, verse 22, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. Or maybe even if you don't, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. How did the writer of Psalm 22 get every single thing accurate about the crucifixion, except the writer of Psalm 22 says, he has not turned his face. But we today believe that the Father turned his face away. 
One of the things that you and I have a tendency to believe is that if you're bad enough, God will turn his face away from you. If Jesus is covered in the sin of the world, the Father has to reject him, has to turn his back on him. But do you not know that what the Father actually does is receives the sacrifice of Jesus? He is pleased with this sacrificial love. He is honored by this infinite act of obedience. The writer of Psalm 22 says this, verse 25, from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. As you keep reading, you get down to verse 30. And it says, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. And they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. The writer of Psalm 22 says, I will fulfill my vow. And then the, the whole psalm concludes with the statement, he has done it. It makes me wonder when we go back to Matthew, and then we read verse 50. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. We know that from some of the other gospels that when Jesus cried out in a loud voice, the words he said were, it is finished. In other words, I've completed my vow. And in other words, he has done it. See, Jesus knew he was going to rise from the dead. That was certain in his mind. He was confident about that. But in order to get to Sunday, he had to go through Friday. He had to walk through, he had to live through the agony and the suffering of the sacrifice. But he did it. He kept his vow. And so did the Father by rise, raising him up on Sunday morning. And then I want to take you to this final section in Matthew 27. Verse 51, right after Jesus breathes his last breath, it says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. See, a few people got the picture. A few people understood what it was really all about when they realized he is raised from the dead. A few people recognized what it was all about when they saw him die and felt the earthquake and all of that. But it was in verse 51 and the statement about the resurrection of the people from the tombs that I want to point your attention to. See, verse 51 tells us the curtain in the temple was torn. See, we think of this story as God turning his back on Jesus because of the sin that was placed on him. But immediately after his death, the curtain in the temple is torn to prove that God is turning ever more fully toward his people. The curtain, the dividing line between us and God is now done over, gone, in the past, never again to return. And to prove this point, not even death can keep people away from God. Because when Jesus rises, so do others. Friends, I just want to give you this encouragement for this week ahead. There are going to be times when you are tempted 
to say the first verse of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are going to be times when you are tempted to say the first half of Psalm 22. God, you've helped other people. Why don't you help me? And there are going to be times when you are tempted to look at your current situation and wallow in the frustration and the pain and the complaint. And there are times when you are tempted to look at someone else in that situation and think God has abandoned them too. But know this. The Jesus who cries out, God, why have you forsaken me, is the Jesus who knows how the story ends. He knows how the psalm ends, and he knows that it ends in victory and triumph, where he can say, I've kept my vow, and so did God. He has not forsaken his loved one. If you are going through an extra special difficult time this week, know this. The God who never forsook his son, but gave his son to you, for you, and received his son's sacrifice on your behalf, is the God who will never, ever turn his back on you. Just don't you turn your back on him. Move towards him. This week especially, open your arms to him and say, God, you are my God. Earnestly, I will seek you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, I'm going to search for you. Let me pray for you. God, especially this week, would you help us to be people who rest in the confidence that you will never leave us or forsake us, who rest in the confidence that when our lives get difficult or tough, that you are still present with us. God, you never abandoned Jesus, and we know that you will never abandon us, and that you can receive us because you have already received his sacrifice. Lord, would you apply his sacrifice to our lives and would you welcome us even more fully into fellowship with you this week? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like some help making the decision to follow Jesus, I invite you to reach out to me sometime this week. I'd love to help you take that step. God bless you. Have a great day.